So uh, this is a uh, recitation, and I'm going to add some uh, descriptive words underneath um, and all over the place. Uh, this is of book nine, and then I'm also going to do book ten of Milton's Paradise Lost. So book nine uh, tells us about uh, Satan getting to Eden and taking on the form of a serpent and then persuading Eve to eat the fruit. And in this case, following the Latin tradition uh, that the word for evil or bad is malo and the word for, for apple is also malo, the fruit in the Garden of Eden is an apple. No more talk where God or angel guest with man, as with his friend, familiar, used to sit indulgent and with him partake rural repast, permitting him the while venial discourse unblamed, I must now change those notes to tragic. Foul distrust and breach disloyal on the part of man, revolt and disobedience. On the part of heaven, now alienated distance and distaste, Anger and just rebuke, and judgment given, that brought into this world a world of woe, sin and her shadow death, and misery death's harbinger. Sad task, yet argument not less but more heroic than the wrath of stern Achilles on his foe pursued, thrice fugitive about Troy wall, or rage of Turnus for Lavinia disespoused, or Neptune's ire, or Juno's that so long perplexed the Greek and Cytheria's son, if answerable style I can obtain of my celestial patroness, who deigns her nightly visitation unimplored and dictates to me slumbering, or inspires easy my unpremeditated verse. Since first this subject for heroic song pleased me long choosing and beginning late, not sedulous by nature to indict wars, hitherto the only argument heroic deemed, chief maestery to dissect with long and tedious havoc fabled knights in battles feigned, the better fortitude of patience and heroic martyrdom unsung, or to describe races and games or titling furniture, emblazoned shields, impresses quaint caparisons and steeds. Bases and tinsel trappings, gorgeous nights of joust and tournament, then marshalled feasts served up in hall with sewers and seneschals, the skill of artifice or office mean. Not that which justly gives heroic name to person or to poem. Me, of these not skilled nor studious, higher argument remains, sufficient of itself to raise that name unless an age too late, or cold climate or years damp, my intended wing depressed, and much they may, if all be mine, not hers, who brings it nightly to my ear. The sun was sunk, and after him the star of Hesperus, whose office is to bring twilight upon the earth, short arbiter twixt day and night, and now from end to end night's hemisphere, hath veiled the horizon round, when Satan, who late fled from the threats of Gabriel out of Eden, now improved in meditated fraud and malice, bent on man's destruction, maugre what might hap of heavier on himself, fearless returned. By night he fled, and at midnight returned, from Compassing the earth, cautious of day, since Uriel, regent of the sun, descried his entrance and forewarned the cherubim that kept their watch. Thence, full of anguish driven, the space of seven continued nights, he rode with darkness, thrice the equinoctial line, he circled four times, crossed the car of night from pole to pole, traversing each colour, on the eighth returned. And on the coast averse, from entrance or cherubic watch, by stealth found unsuspected way, there was a place, now not, 
Though sin, not time, first wrought the change, where Tigris at the foot of paradise into a gulf shot underground till part rose up a fountain by the tree of life. In with the river sunk, and with it rose Satan, involved in rising mist, then sought where to lie hid. See, he had searched and land from Eden over Pontus, and the pool Mautis, up beyond the river Ob, downward as far Antarctic, and in length west, from Arontes to the ocean barred Darien, thence to the land where flows Ganges and Indus. Thus the orb he roamed with narrow search, and with inspection deep, considered every creature, which of all most opportune might serve his wiles, and found the serpent, subtlest beast of all the field. Him, after long debate, irresolute of thoughts revolved, his final sentence chose fit vessel, fittest imp of fraud, in whom to enter, and his dark suggestions hide from sharpest sight. For, in the wily snake, whatever slights none would suspicious mark as from his wit and native subtlety proceeding, which in other beasts observed doubt might beget of diabolic power, active within, beyond the sense of brute. Thus he resolved, but first from inward grief his bursting passion into plaints thus poured. O oh, earth! How like to heaven, if not preferred more justly, seat worthier of gods as built with second thoughts, reforming what was old. For what god after better worse would build? Terrestrial heaven, danced round by other heavens that shine, yet bear their bright officious lamps, light above light, for thee alone, as seems in thee concentring all their precious beams of sacred influence. As God in heaven is centre, yet extends to all, so thou centring receifts from all those orbs. In thee, not in themselves, all their known virtue appears productive in herb, plant, and nobler birth of creatures animate with gradual life of growth, sense, reason, all summed up in man. With what delight could I have walked thee round if I could joy in aught, sweet interchange of hill and valley, rivers, woods and plains, now land, now sea, and with shores, with forests crowned, rocks, dens and caves, but I in none of these find place or refuge, and more, I see pleasures about me, so much more I feel torment within me as from the hateful siege of contraries. All good to me becomes bane, and in heaven much worse would be my state. But neither here seek I, no, nor in heaven to dwell unless by mastering heaven's supreme, nor hope to be myself less miserable by what I seek, but others to make such as I, though thereby worse to me redound. For only in destroying I find ease to my relentless thoughts, and him destroyed or won to what may work his utter loss. For whom all this was made, all this will soon follow as to him linked in weal or woe, in woe then, that destruction wide may range, to me shall be the glory soul among the infernal powers in one day to have marred what the almighty styled six days and nights continued making, and who knows how long before had been contriving though perhaps not longer than since I in one night freed from servitude inglorious, well nigh half the angelic name, and thither left the throng of his adorers, he to be avenged, and to repair his numbers thus impaired, whether such virtue spent of old now failed more angels to create, if they at least are his created, or to spite us more determined to advance into our room, a creature formed of earth, 
than him and thou, exalted from so base original with heavenly spoils. Our spoils? What he decreed, he effected. Man he made, and for him built magnificent this world, and earth his seat, him Lord pronounced, and, oh, indignity, subjected to his service angel wings, and flaming ministers to watch and tend their earthly charge. Of these the vigilance I dread, and to elude thus wrapped in mist, of midnight vapour glide obscure, and pry in every bush and brake, where hap may find the serpent sleeping, in whose mazy folds do hide me, and the dark intent I bring. O oh, foul descent, that I, who erst contended with gods, to sit in the highest, am now constrained into a beast, and mixed with bestial slime, this essence to incarnate and imbute, that to the height of deity aspired. But what will not ambition and revenge descend to? Who aspires must down as low as high he soared, obnoxious first as last to basest things. Revenge, at first though sweet, bitter, her long back on itself recoils. Let it. I reck not. So it light well aimed, since higher I fall short on him who next provokes my envy, this new favourite of heaven, this man of clay, son of despite, whom us the more to spite his maker raised from dust. Spite, then with spite, is best repaid. So saying, through each thicket, dank or dry, like a black mist, low creeping, he held on his midnight search, where soonest he might find the serpent. Him, fast sleeping, soon he found in labyrinth of many a round self rolled his head the midst well stored with subtle wiles. Not yet in horrid shade or dismal den, nor nocent yet, but on the grassy herb, fearless unfeared, he slept. In at his mouth the devil entered, and his brutal sense in heart or head possessing soon inspired with act intelligential, but his sleep disturbed not, waiting close the approach of morn. Now, when a sacred light began to dawn in Eden on the humid flowers that breathe their morning incense, when all things that breath from the earth's great altar sent up with silent praise to the Creator and his nostrils filled with grateful smell, forth came the human pair and joined their vocal worship to the choir of creatures wanting voice. That done, partake the season, prime for sweetest scents and airs. Then commune how that day they best may ply their growing work. For much their work outgrew the hand's dispatch of two gardening so wide. And Eve first to her husband thus began. Adam, well, may we labour still to dress this garden, still to tend, plant, herb and flower, our present task enjoined. But till more hands aid us, the work under our labour grows, luxurious by restraint. What we by day lop, overgrown, or prune, or prop, or bind, one night or two with wanton growth derides, tending to wild. Thou therefore now advise, or hear what to my mind first thoughts present, let us divide our labours. Thou, where choice leads thee, or where most needs, whither to wind the woodbind round this arbour, or direct the clasping ivy where to climb, while I, in yonder spring of roses, intermixed with myrtle, find what to redress till noon. For while so near each other thus all day our task we choose, what wonder 
if so near looks intervene and smiles, or object new casual discourse draw on, which intermits our day's work brought to little. Though begun early, and the hour of supper comes unearned. To whom, mild answer, Adam thus returned. Soul, Eve. Associate soul, to me beyond compare, above all living creatures dear. Well hast thou motioned, well thy thoughts employed, how we might best fulfil the work which here God hath assigned us. Nor of me shalt pass unpraised, for nothing lovelier can be found in woman than to study household good and good works in her husband to promote. Yet, not so strictly hath our Lord imposed labour as to debar us when we need refreshment, whether food or talk between, food of the mind or this sweet intercourse of looks and smiles. For smiles from reason flow, to brute denied, and are of love the food, love, not the lowliest end of human life, and not to irksome toil, but to delight he made us, and delight to reason joined. These paths and bowers, doubt not, but our joint hands will keep from wilderness with ease, as wide as we need walk, till younger hands ere long assist us. But if much converse perhaps thee satiate, to short absence I could yield. For solitude sometimes is best society, and short retirement urges sweet return. But other doubt possesses me, lest harm befall thee, severed from me. For thou know'st what hath been warned us, what malicious foe, envying our happiness, and of his own despairing, seeks to work us woe and shame by sly assault. And somewhere nigh at hand watches, no doubt, with greedy hope to find his wish and best advantage, us asunder, hopeless to circumvent us joined, where each to other speedy aid might lend at need. Whether his first design be to withdraw our fealty from God, or to disturb conjugal love, then which perhaps no bliss enjoined by us excites his envy more. Or this, or worse, Leave not the faithful side that gave thee being, still shades thee and protects. The wife, where danger or dishonour lurks, safest and seemliest, by her husband stays, who guards her, and with her the worst endures. To whom the virgin majesty of Eve as one who loves and some unkindness meets with sweet austere composure thus replied, Offspring of heaven and earth and all earth's lord, that such an enemy we have who seeks our ruin, both by thee informed I learned and from the parting angel overheard as in a shady nook I stood behind, just then returned at shut of evening flowers. But that thou shouldst my firmness therefore doubt to God or thee, because we have a foe may tempt it, I expected not to hear his violence, thou fearest not, being such as we, not capable of death or pain, can either not receive or can repel. His fraud is then thy fear, which pain infers, Thy equal fear that my fear that my firm faith and love can by his fraud be shaken or seduced. Thoughts, which how found thy labour in thy breast, Adam, misthought of her to thee so dear. To whom, with healing words, Adam replied, Daughter of God and man, immortal Eve, for such thou art, from sin and blame entire. Not dividend of thee do I dissuade thy absence from my sight, but to avoid the attempt itself, intended by our foe. For he who tempts, though in vain at least asperses thee tempted with dishonour foul, suppose not incorruptible of faith, nor proof against temptation. 
Thou thyself with scorn and anger wouldst resent the offered wrong. Though ineffectual found, misdeem not then, if such affront I labour to avert from thee alone, which on us both at once the enemy, though bold, will hardly dare, or daring first at, on me the assault shall light, nor thou his malice and false guile contemn. Subtle he needs must be, who could seduce angels, nor think superfluous others' aid. I, from the influence of thy looks, receive access in every virtue, in thy sight more wise, more watchful, stronger, if need were of outward strength, while shame thou looking on, shame to be overcome or overreached would utmost vigour raise, and raised unite. Why shouldst not thou like sense within thee feel when I am present and thy trial choose with me best witness of thy virtue tried? So spake domestic Adam in his care a matrimonial love. But Eve, who thought less attributed to her faith sincere, thus her reply with accent sweet renewed. If this be our condition thus to dwell in narrow circuits strained by a foe, subtle or violent, we not endued, single, with like defence, wherever met, how are we happy still in fear of harm? But harm proceeds not sin, only our foe tempting affronts us with his foul esteem of our integrity. His foul esteem sticks no dishonour on our front, but turns foul on himself. Then wherefore should or feared by us? Who rather double honour gain from his surmise prove false? Find peace within, favour from heaven, a witness from the event. And what is faith, love, virtue unassayed? alone without exterior help sustained. Let us not then suspect our happy state left so imperfect by the maker wise as not secure to single or combined. Frail is our happiness if this be so, and Eden were no Eden thus exposed. To whom, thus Adam fervently replied, O woman, best are all things as the will of God ordained them. His creating hand nothing imperfect or deficient left of all that he created, much less man, or aught that might his happy state secure, secure from outward force. Within himself, against his will, he can receive no harm, but God left free the will. For what obeys reason is free, and reason he made right. But bid her well beware and still erect, lest by some fair appearing good, surprised, she dictate false and misinform the will to do what God expressly hath forbid. Not then mistrust, but tender love enjoins, that I should mind thee oft, and mind thou me. Firm we subsist, yet possible to swerve, since reason not impossibly may meet some specious object by the foe suborned, and fall into deception unaware not keeping strictest watch, as she was warned. Seek not temptation then, which to avoid were better and most likely, if from me thou sever not. Trial will come unsought. Wouldst thou approve thy constancy, approve first thy obedience, the other who can know, not seeing thee attempted, who attest? But... If thou think trial and sort may find us both securer, then thus be warned thou seemest go. For thy stay not free absents thee more. Go in thy native innocence, rely on what thou hast of virtue, summon all, for God toward thee hath done his part do thine. So spake the patriarch of mankind, but Eve persisted, yet submiss, though last, replied, with thy permission then, and thus forewarned chiefly by what thy own last reasoning words touched only, that one trial, when least sought, may find us both perhaps far less prepared, the willinger I go, nor much expect a foe so proud, 
will first the weaker seek. So bent, the more shall shame him his repulse. Thus saying from her husband's hand, her hand soft she withdrew, and like a wood nymph light, or erred or dyed, or of Delia's train, betook her to the groves. But Delia's self in gates are past, and goddess-like deport, though not as she with bow and quiver armed, but with such gardening tools as art yet rude, guiltless of fire had formed, or angels bought to parleys, or Pomona thus adorned. Likeliest she seemed Pomona when she fled Vertumnus, or to Ceres in her prime, yet virgin of Proserpina from Jove. Her long with ardent look his eye pursued, delighted, but desired more her stay. Oft he to his charge of quick return repeated, she to him as oft engaged to be returned by noon amid the bower, and all things in best order to invite noontide repast or afternoon's repose. No oh, much deceived, much failing hapless Eve, of thy presumed return, event perverse. Thou never from that hour in paradise found either sweet repast or sound repose. Such ambush, hid among sweet flowers and shades, waited with hellish rancour imminent to intercept thy way, or send thee back despoiled of innocence, of faith, of bliss. For now, and since first break of dawn, the fiend mere serpent in appearance forth was come, and on his quest where likeliest he might find the only two of mankind, but in them the whole included race his purposed prey. In bower and field he sought where any tuft of grove or garden plot more pleasant lay, their tendance or plantation for delight, by fountain or by shady rivulet he sought them both, but wished his hap might find Eve separate. He wished, but not with hope, of what so seldom chanced when to his wish. Beyond his hope Eve separate he spies, veiled in a cloud of fragrance where she stood, half spied, so thick the roses blushing round about her glowed, oft stooping to support each flower of stender stalk, whose head, though gay, carnation, purple, azure, or speck with gold hung drooping unsustained, them she upstays gently with myrtle band, mindless the while herself, though fairest unsupported flower. From her best prop so far and storm so nigh, nearer he drew and many a walk traversed of stateliest covert cedar, pine or palm, then voluble and bold now hid, now seen among thick woven arborets and flowers emboldered on each bank the hand of Eve. Spot more delicious then those gardens feigned or of revived Adonis or renowned Alcinous, host of old Laertes' son, or that not mystic where the sapient king held dalliance with his fair Egyptian spouse. Much he the place admired, the person more, as one who long in populous city pent, where houses thick and sewers annoy the air, forth issuing on a summer's morn to breathe among the pleasant villages and farms adjoined. From each thing met conceives delight, the smell of grain, or tedded grass or kine, or dairy, each rural sight, each rural sound. If chance with nymph-like step fair virgin pass, what pleasing seemed for her now pleases more, she most, and in her look sums all delight. Such pleasure took the serpent to behold this flowery plat, the sweet recess of Eve, thus early, thus alone, her heavenly form angelic, but more soft and feminine, her graceful innocence, 
Her every air of gesture or lest action overawed his malice, and with rapine sweet bereaved his fierceness of the fierce intended broad. That space the evil once abstracted stood from his own evil, and for the time remained stupidly good. Of enmity disarmed, of guile, of hate, of envy, of revenge, but the hot hell that always in him burns, though in mid-heaven soon ended his delight, and tortures him now more, the more he sees of pleasure not for him ordained, then soon fierce hate he recollects, and all his thoughts of mischief, gratulating, thus excites. Thoughts, whither have ye led me, with what sweet compulsion thus transported to forget, what hither brought us hate, not love nor hope, of paradise for hell. Hope here to taste a pleasure, but all pleasure to destroy, save what is in destroying, other joy to me is lost. Then let me not let pass occasion which now smiles, behold alone the woman opportune, to all attempt her husband, for I view far round, not nigh, whose higher intellectual more I shun, and strength of courage, haughty and of limb heroic built, though of terrestrial mould, for not in formidable except from wound I not, so much hath held debased and pain enfeebled me, to what I was in heaven. She fair, divinely fair, fit love for gods, not terrible, though terror be in love and beauty, not approached by stronger hate, hate stronger, under shoe of love well feigned, the way which to her ruin now I tend. So spake the enemy of mankind, enclosed in serpent, inmate bad, and toward Eve addressed his way, not with indented wave prone on the ground as since, but on his rear, circular base of rising folds that toward fold above fold, a surging maze, his head crested aloft, and carbuncle his eyes, with burnished neck of verdant gold, erect, amidst his circling spires that on the grass floated redundant. Pleasing was his shape and lovely, never since of serpent kind lovelier, not those that in Illyria changed Hermione and Cadmus, or the god in Epidavros, nor to which transformed Ammonian Jove or Capitoline was seen, he with Olympius, this with her who bore Scipio the height of Rome with tract oblique at first as one who sought access, but feared to interrupt sigh long he works his way, as when a ship by skilful steersman wrought nigh river's mouth or foreland, where with wind veers oft as oft to steers, and shifts her sail so varied he, and of his torturous train curled many a wanton wreath in sight of Eve to lure her eye. She busied heard the sound of rustling leaves, but minded not, as used to such deport before her, through the field from every beast more duteous at her call. than at Sicyrian call the herd disguised. He bolder now uncalled before her stood. But as in gaze admiring, oft he bowed his turrent crest and sleek enamelled neck, fawning and licked the ground whereon she trod. His gentle dumb expression turned at length the eye of Eve to mark his play. He glad of her attention gained with serpent tongue organic, or impulse of vocal air, his fraudulent temptation thus began. Wonder not, sovereign mistress, if perhaps thou canst, who art so wonder, much less arm thy looks, the heaven of mildness with disdain, displeased that I approach thee thus, and gaze insatiate, either single, not have feared thy awful brow, more awful thus retired, fairest semblance of thy maker, fair thee of all things, gaze on, all things thine by gift, and thy celestial beauty adore with ravishment beheld, there best beheld, where universally admired. 
But here, in this enclosure wild, these beasts among beholders rude and shallow to discern half what in thee is fair, one man except, who sees thee, and what is one? Who should be seen a goddess among gods, adored and served by angels numberless, thy daily train? So glozed the tempter, and his poem tuned into the heart of Eve, his words made way. Though at the voice much marvelling, at length, not unamazed, she thus in answer spake, What may this mean? Language of man pronounced by tongue of brute? and human sense expressed. The first, at least, of these I thought denied to beasts, whom God on their creation day created mute to all articular sound. The latter I demure, for in their looks much reason, and in their actions oft appears. These serpents, subtlest beasts of all the field, I knew, but not with human voice endued. Double then this miracle, and say, How camest thou speakable of mute, and how to me so friendly grown above the rest of brutal kind, that daily are in sight? Say, for such wonder claims attention due. To whom the guileful tempter thus replied, M. Of this fair world resplendent Eve, easy to me it is to tell thee all what thou commandst, and right thou shouldst be obeyed. I was at first, as other beasts that grazed the trotten herb, of abject thoughts and low, as was my food. Nor aught but food discerned, or sex, and apprehended nothing high, till on a day... Roving the field, I chanced a goodly tree, far distant to behold, loaded with fruit of fairest colours mixed, ruddy and gold, I nearer drew to gaze, when from the boughs a savoury odour blown, grateful to appetite, more pleased my sense than smell of sweetest fennel, or the teats of you or goat dropping with milk at even, unsucked of lamb or kid that tend their play, to satisfy the sharp desire I had of tasting those fair apples, I resolved not to defer hunger and thirst at once, powerful persuaders quickened at the scent of that alluring fruit urged me so keen about the mossy trunk i wound me soon for high from ground the branches would require thy utmost reach or adams round the tree all other beasts that saw with like desire longing and envying stood but could not reach Amid the tree now got where plenty hung, tempting so nigh, to pluck and eat my fill I spared not for such pleasure till that hour at feed or fountain never had I found. Sated at length, ere long I might perceive strange alteration in me, to degree of reason in my inward powers and speech, wanted not long, though to this shape retained. Thenceforth to speculations high or deep I turned my thoughts, and with capacious mind considered all things visible in heaven, or earth, or middle, all things fair and good. But all that fair and good in thy divine semblance, and in thy beauteous heavenly ray united, I beheld no fair to thine equivalent or second, which compelled me thus, though importune perhaps to come and gaze and worship thee of right declared sovereign of creatures, universal dame. So taught the spirited sly snake, and Eve, yet more amazed, unwary, thus replied, Serpent, thy overpraising leaves in doubt the virtue of that fruit in thee first proved. But say, where grows the tree? From hence, how far? For many are the trees of God that grow in paradise, and various, yet unknown to us, in such abundance lies our choice. As leaves, a greater store of fruit untouched, still hanging incorruptible, till men grow up to their provision, and more hands help to disburden nature of her birth. To whom the wily adder, blithe and glad, Empress, the way is ready and not long, beyond a row of myrtles on a flat fast by a fountain, one small thicket past of blowing myrrh and balm. If thou accept my conduct, 
I can bring thee hither soon. Lead then, said Eve. He, leading swiftly, rolled in tangles and made intricate seem straight to mischief swift. Hope elevates and joy brightens his crest, as when a wandering fire, compact of unctuous vapour, which the night condenses and the cold environs round, kindled through agitation to a flame, which oft, they say, some evil spirit attends hovering and blazing with delusive light, misleads the amazed night wanderer from his way to bogs and mires, and oft, through pond or pool, they're swallowed up and lost from succour far. So glistened the dire snake, and into fraud led Eve, our credulous mother, to the tree of prohibition, root of all our woe. Which, when she saw, thus to her guide she spake, Serpent! We might have spared our coming hither, fruitless to me, though fruit be here to excess, the credit of whose virtue rest with thee, wondrous indeed if cause of such effects. But of this tree we may not taste nor touch. God so commanded, and left that command so daughter of his voice. The rest, we live law to ourselves, our reason is our law. To whom the tempter guilefully replied, Indeed. Hath God then said that of the fruit of all these garden trees ye shall not eat, yet lords declared of all in earth or air? To whom thus Eve, yet sinless, of the fruit of each tree in the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of this fair tree amidst the garden God hath said ye shall not eat thereof, nor shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She scarce had said, though brief, when now more bold the tempter, but with show of zeal and love to man and indignation at his wrong, new part puts on, and as to passion moved, fluctuates disturbed yet comely, and in act raised as of some great matter to begin, as when of old some orator renowned in Athens or free Rome, where eloquence flourished since mute to some great cause addressed, stood in himself collected, while each part motion, each act won audience, ere the tongue sometimes in height began, as no delay of preface brooking through his zeal of right, so standing, moving, or, to height upgrown, the tempter all in passion thus began, O oh, sacred, wise, and wisdom-giving plant, mother of science, now I feel thy power within me clear, not only to discern things in their causes, but to trace the ways of highest agents, deemed however wise. Queen of this universe, do not believe those rigid threats of death. Ye shall not die. How should ye? By the fruit? It gives you life to knowledge. By the threatener, look on me, me who have touched and tasted, yet both live. And life more perfect hath attained than fate meant me, by venturing higher than my lot. Shall that be shut to man, which to beast is open? Or will God incense his ire for such a petty trespass, and not praise rather your dauntless virtue, whom the pain of death denounced, Whatever thing death be, deterred not from achieving what might lead to happier life, knowledge of good and evil, of good, how just, of evil, if what is evil be real, why not known since easier shunned? God therefore cannot hurt ye, and be just, not just, not God, not feared, then not obeyed. Your fear itself of death removes the fear. Why then was this forbid? Why but to awe? Why but to keep ye low and ignorant his worshippers? He knows that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes that seem so clear, yet are but dim, shall perfectly be then oped and cleared, and ye shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil as they know that ye should be as God, since I, as man in turn or man, is but proportion meet, I, of brute human, ye, of human gods. So, ye shall die, perhaps, by putting off human, to put on gods, death to be wished, though threatened, which no worse than this can bring. And what are gods 
The man may not become as they, participating godlike food. The gods are first, and that advantage use on our belief that all from them proceeds. I question it. For this fair earth I see, worn by the sun and producing every kind, them nothing. If they all things, who enclosed knowledge of good and evil in this tree, that whoso eats thereof forthwith attains wisdom without their leave? And wherein lies the offence that man should thus attain to know? What can your knowledge hurt him, or this tree impart against his will, if all be his? Or is it envy, and can envy dwell in heavenly breasts? These and many more causes import your need of this fair fruit. Goddess human, reach them and freely taste. He ended in his words replete with guile into her heart, too easy entrance won, fixed on the fruit she gazed, which to behold might tempt alone, and in her ears she s the sound yet rung of his persuasive words, impregned with reason to her seeming and with truth. Meanwhile the hour of noon drew on, and waked an eager appetite raised by the smell so savoury of that fruit, which with desire inclinable now grown to touch or taste solicited her longing eye, yet first pausing a while, thus to herself she mused, Great are thy virtues, doubtless best of fruits, though kept from man, and worthy to be admired, whose taste too long forborne at first essay gave elocution to the mute, and taught the tongue not made for speech to speak thy praise. Thy praise he also, who forbids thy use, conceals not from us, naming thee the tree of knowledge, knowledge both of good and evil, forbids us then to taste but his forbidding commends thee more, while it infers the good by thee communicated and our want. For good unknown, sure, is not had, or had and yet unknown, is as not had at all. In plain, then, what forbids he but to know, forbids us good, forbids us to be wise, such prohibitions bind not, but if death bind us with after bands, what profits then our inward freedom? In the day we eat of this fair fruit, our doom is we shall die. How dies the serpent? He hath eaten and lives and knows and speaks and reasons and discerns, irrational till then. For us alone was death invented. Or to us denied this intellectual food for beasts is reserved, for beasts it seems. Yet that one beast, which first hath tasted, envies not, nor brings with joy the good fallen him, author unsuspect, friendly to man, far from deceit or guile. What fear I then, rather, what know to fear under this ignorance of good and evil, of God or death or law or penalty? Here grows the cure of all, this fruit divine, fair to the eye, inviting to the taste of virtue to make wise. What hinders then to reach and feed at once both body and mind, so saying her rash hand in evil hour forth reached to the fruit she plucked, she ate, earth felt the wound and nature from her seat, sighing through all her works gave signs of woe that all was lost. Back to the thicket slunk the guilty serpent, and well might, for Eve intent now wholly on her taste, nought else regarded such delight till then it seemed, in fruit she never tasted, whether true or fancied, so through expectation high of knowledge, nor was Godhead from her thought, greedily she engorged, without restraint, and knew not eating death. Satiate at length and heightened as with wine, jocund and boon, thus to herself she pleasingly began. 
O oh, sovereign, virtuous, precious of all trees in paradise of operation, blessed to sapience, hitherto obscured in famed, and thy fair fruit let hang as to no end created. But henceforth my early care, not without song each morning and due praise, shall tend thee and the fertile burden ease of thy full branches, offered free to all, till dieted by thee I mature in knowledge, as the gods who all things know, though others envy what they cannot give, for had the gift been theirs, it had not here thus grown. Experience next to thee I owe best guide, not following thee I had remained in ignorance. Thou op'st wisdom's way and givest access, though secret she retire. And I, perhaps, am secret. Heaven is high, high and remote to see, from thence distinct each thing on earth, and other care perhaps may have diverted from continual watch our great forbidder, safe with all his spies about him. But to Adam in what sort shall I appear? Shall I... To him make known as yet my change, and give him to partake full happiness with me. Or rather not, and keep the odds of knowledge in my power without co-partner. So to add, what once in female sex, the more to draw his love, and render me more equal, and perhaps a thing not undesirable, sometimes superior. For inferior, who is free? This may be well. But what if God hath seen and death ensue? Then I shall be no more, and Adam wedded to another Eve, shall live with her enjoying I extinct? A death to think. Confirmed then I resolve, Adam shall share with me in bliss or woe. So dear I love him, that with him all deaths I could endure, without him live no life. So saying, from the tree her step she turned, but first low reverence don, as to the power that dwelt within, whose presence had infused into the plant shenshul sap, derived from nectar, drink of gods. Adam the while, waiting desirous her return, had wove of choicest flowers a garland to adore her tresses, and her rural labours crown, as reapers oft are wont their harvest queen. Great joy he promised to his thoughts, and new solace in her return so long delayed. Yet oft his heart, divine of something ill, misgave him. He the faltering measure felt, and forth to meet her went the way she took that morn when first they parted. By the tree of knowledge he must pass, there he her met, scarce from the tree returning in her hand, a bough of fairest fruit that downy smiled, new gathered, and ambrosial smell diffused. To him she hasted. In her face excuse came prologue and apology to prompt, which with bland words at will she thus addressed. Hast thou not wounded, Adam, at my stay? Thee I have missed and thought it long, deprive thy presence, agony of love till now not felt, nor shall be twice, for evermore mean I to try what rash untried I sought the pain of absence from thy sight. But strange hath been the cause, and wonderful to hear, this tree is not as we were told a tree of danger tasted, nor to evil unknown opening the way, but of divine effect to open eyes and make them gods who taste. And hath been tasted such, the serpent wise, or not restrained as we, or not obeying, hath eaten of the fruit and is become not dead as we were threatened, but thenceforth endued with human voice and human sense, reasoning to admiration, and with me persuasively hath so prevailed that I have also tasted and have also found the effects to correspond opener mine eyes. Dim, erst dilated spirits, 
ampler heart and growing up to Godhead, which for thee chiefly I sought, without thee can despise. For bliss, as thou hast part, to me is bliss, tedious unshared with thee, and odious soon. Thou therefore also taste an equal lot, may join as equal joy as equal love. Least thou, not tasting different degree, disjoin us, and I then too late renounce deity for thee, when fate will not permit. Thus Eve, with countenance blithe, her story told, but in her cheek distemper, flushing growed. On the other side, Adam, soon as he heard the fatal trespass done by Eve, amazed, astonished, stood and blank, with horror chill ran through his veins, and all his joints relaxed. From his slack hand the garland wreathed for Eve down dropped, and all the faded roses shed. Speechless he stood and pale, till thus at length, first to himself, he inward silent broke. O fairest of creation, last and best of all God's works, creature in whom excelled, whatever can to sight or thought be formed, holy, divine, good, amiable, or sweet. How art thou lost? How on a sudden lost? Defaced, deflowered, and now to death devote. Rather, how hast thou yielded to transgress the strict forbiddance? How to violate the sacred fruit forbidden? Some cursed fraud of enemy hath beguiled thee, yet unknown, and me with thee hath ruined, for with thee certain my resolution is to die. How can I live without thee? How forgo the sweet converse and love so dearly joined to live again in these wild woods forlorn? Should God create another Eve and I another rib afford, yet loss of thee would never from my heart... No, no! I feel the link of nature draw me, flesh of flesh, bone of my bone thou art, and from thy state mine never shall be parted bliss or woe. So having said, as one, from sad dismay recomforted, and after thoughts disturbed, submitting to what seemed remediless, thus in calm mood, his words to Eve he turned. Bold deed thou hast presumed, adventurous Eve, and peril great provoked. Who thus hast dared? Had it been only coveting to eye that sacred fruit, sacred to abstinence, much more to taste it under ban, to touch, but past who can recall or done undo, not God omnipotent nor fate, yet so perhaps thou shalt not die, perhaps the fact is not so heinous now, for tasted fruit, profaned first by the serpent, by him first made common and unhallowed ere our taste, nor yet on him found deadly, he yet lives, lives as thou saidst, and gains to life as man, higher degree of life, inducement strong to us, as likely tasting to attain proportional assent, which cannot be but to be gods, or angels, demigods. Nor can I think that God, creator wise, though threatening, will in earnest so destroy us, his prime creatures, dignified so high, set over all his works, which in our fall for us created, needs with us must fail, dependent made. So God shall uncreate, be frustrate, do undo, and labour lose, nor well conceived of God, who through his power creation could repeat, yet would be loath us to abolish, lest the adversary triumph and say, fickle their state whom God most favours. Who can please him long? Me first he ruined, now mankind. Whom will be next? Matter of scorn, not to be given the foe. However, I with thee have fixed my lot, certain to undergo like doom if death consort with thee. Death is to me as life. So forcible within my heart I feel the bond of nature draw me to mine own, mine own in thee, for what thou art is mine. Our state cannot be severed, we are one, one flesh. To lose thee were to lose myself. So Adam and thus Eve to him replied, O glorious trial of exceeding love, illustrious evidence, example high, engaging me to emulate, but short of thy perfection, 
how shall I attain? Adam, from whose dear side I boast me sprung, and gladly of our union hear thee speak, one heart, one soul in both, whereof good proof this day affords, declaring thee resolved, rather than death or aught than death, more dread shall separate us, linked in love so dear, to undergo with me one guilt, one crime, if any be, of tasting this fair fruit, whose virtue, for of good, still good, proceeds, direct, or by occasion hath presented this happy trial of, our, of thy love, which else so eminently never had been known. Were it, I thought, death menaced, would ensue this my attempt, I would sustain alone the worst, and not persuade thee, rather die deserted, than oblige thee with a fact pernicious to thy peace, chiefly assured, remarkably, so late of thy, so true, so faithful, love unequalled, but I feel far otherwise the event, not death, but life augmented, oped eyes, new hope, new joys taste so divine that what of sweet before hath touched my sense flat seems to this and harsh on my experience adam freely taste and fear of death deliver to the winds so saying she embraced him and for joy tenderly wept much one that he his love had so ennobled as of choice to incur divine displeasure for her sake or death in recompense for such compliance, bad such recompense, best merits, from the bough she gave him of that fair enticing fruit with liberal hand, he sculpted not to eat against his better knowledge, not deceived but fondly overcome with female charm, earth trembled from her entrails as again in pangs, and nature gave a second groan, sky lowered and muttering thunder, some sad drops wept at completing of the mortal sin original, while Adam took no thought eating his fill, nor Eve to iterate her former trespass feared, the more to soothe him with her loved society, that now, as with new wine intoxicated, both they swim in mirth, and fancy that they feel divinity within them breeding wings, wherewith to scorn the earth. But that false fruit, far other operation first displayed, Carnal desire inflaming, he on Eve began to cast lascivious eyes. She gave him as wantonly repaid. In lust they burned till Adam thus gan Eve to dalliance move. Eve, now I see thou art exact of taste and elegant of sapience no small part since to each meaning savour we apply and palate call judicious i the praise yield thee so well this day thou hast purveyed much pleasure we have lost while we abstain from this delightful fruit nor known till now true relish tasting. If such pleasure be in things to us forbidden, it might be wished, for this one tree had been forbidden ten. But come so well refreshed, now let us play, as meat is after such delicious fare. For never did thy beauty since the day I saw thee first and wedded thee, adorned with all perfection, so enflame my sense with ardour to enjoy thee, fairer now than ever bounty of this wondrous tree. So said he, and forbore, nor glance or toy of amorous intent, well understood of Eve, whose eye darted contagious fire. Her hand he seized, and to a shady bank, thick overhead with verdant roof embowered, he led her nothing loath. Flowers were the couch, pansies and violets and asphodel, and hyacinth, earth's freshest, softest lap. There they their fill of love and love's disport took largely of their mutual guilt the seal, the solace of their sin till dewy sleep oppressed them, wearied with their amorous play. Soon, as the force of that fallacious fruit, 
that with exhilarating vapour bland about their spirits had played, and inmost powers made air, was now exhaled, and grosser sleep bred of unkindly fumes, with conscious dreams encumbered, now had left them, up they rose as from unrest, and each the other viewing, soon found their eyes how oped, and their minds how darkened innocence, that as a veil had shadowed them from knowing ill was gone. Just confidence and native righteousness and honour from about them naked left to guilty shame he covered, but his robe uncovered more so rose the Danite strong Herculean Samson from the harlot lap of Philistian Delilah and waked shorn of his strength. They destitute and bare of all their virtue, silent and in face confounded, long they sat as strucken mute, till Adam, though not less than Eve abashed, at length gave utterance to these words constrained. Eve, in evil hour thou didst give ear to that false worm, of whomsoever taught to counterfeit man's voice, true in our fall, false in our promised rising, since our eyes open, we find indeed and find we know both good and evil, good lost and evil got, bad fruit of knowledge, if this be to know, which leaves us naked thus of honour, void of innocence, of faith, of purity, our wanted ornaments now sold and stained, and in our faces evident the signs of foul concupiscence, whence evil store. Even shame, the last of evils, and of the first be sure then, how shall I behold the face thenceforth of God or angel, erst with joy and rapture so oft beheld? Those heavenly shapes will dazzle now this earthly, with their blaze insufferably bright. Oh, might I here in solitude live savage, in some glade obscured, where highest woods impenetrable to star or sunlight spread their umbrage broad and brown as evening cover me, yet pines, ye cedars with innumerable boughs hide me where I may never see them more. But let me now, as in bad plight, devise what best may from the present serve to hide the parts of each the other that seem most to shame obnoxious and unseemly as seen some tree whose broad smooth leaves together sewed and girded on our loins may cover round those middle parts that this newcomer shame there sit not and reproach us as unclean. So counselled he, and both together went into the thickest wood. There soon they chose the fig tree, not that kind for fruit renowned, but such as this day to Indians known as Malabar, or Deccan, spreads her arms branching so broad and long that in the ground the bended twigs take root and daughters grow about the mother tree a pillared shade, high overarched, and echoing walks between. There oft the Indian herdsman shunning heat, shelters in cool, and tends his pasturing herds at loopholes cut through the thickest shade. Those leaves they gathered broad as Amazonian targe, and with what skill they had together sewed to gird their waist, vain covering, if to hide their guilt and dreadful shame, oh, how unlike to that first naked glory. Such of late Columbus found the American so girt with feathered sinature, naked else and wild among the trees on isles and woody shores, thus fenced, and as they thought their shame in part covered, but not at rest or ease of mind, they sat them down to weep. Not only tears rained at their eyes, but high winds worse within began to rise. High passions, anger, hate, mistrust, suspicion, discord, and shook, saw their inward state of mind. Calm religion once, and full of peace, now tossed and turbulent, for understanding ruled not, 
and the will heard not her law, both in subjection now to sensual appetite, who from beneath usurping over sovereign reason claimed superior sway. From thus distempered breast Adam, estranged in look and altered style, speech intermittent, thus to Eve renewed, would thou hadst hearkened to my words and stayed with me as I besought thee when that strange desire of wandering this unhappy morn I know not whence possessed thee we had then remained still happy not as now despoiled of all our good shame naked miserable yet none henceforth seek needless cause to approve the faith they owe when earnestly they seek such proof conclude, they then begin to fail. To whom soon moved with touch of blame thus Eve? What words have passed thy lips, Adam, severe, imputest thou that to my default, or will of wandering, as thou callest it, which who knows but might as ill have happed thou being by? or to thyself perhaps, hadst thou been there, or hear the attempt, thou couldst not have discerned fraud in the serpent, speaking as he spake, no ground of enmity between us known, why he should mean me ill, or seek to harm, was I to have never parted from thy side, as good have grown there still a lifeless rib, being as I am, why didst not thou, the head, command me absolutely not to go? going into such danger, as thou saidst. Too frail, then, thou didst not much gainsay. Nay, didst permit, approve, and fair dismiss. Hadst thou been firm and fixed in thy descent, neither had I transgressed, nor thou with me. To whom then, first incensed, Adam replied, Is this the love, is this the recompense of mine to thee, ungrateful Eve? expressed immutable, when thou wert lost, not I, who might have lived and joyed immortal bliss, yet willingly chose rather death with thee, and am I now upbraided as the cause of thy transgressing? Not enough severe, it seems, in thy restraint. What could I more? I warn thee, I admonish thee, foretold the danger and the lurking enemy that lay in wait. Beyond this had been force, and force upon free will here hath no place. But confidence then bore thee on, secure, either to meet no danger or to find matter of glorious trial. And perhaps I also erred in overmuch admiring what seemed in thee so perfect, that I thought no evil durst attempt thee. But I rue that error now, which has become my crime, and thou the accuser. Thus it shall befall him who, to worth in women over trusting, lets her will rule. Restraint she will not brook, and left to herself, if evil thence ensue, she first his weak indulgence will accuse. Thus they, in mutual accusation, spent the fruitless hours, but neither self-condemning, and of their vain contest, appeared no end. Book 10 of Milton's Paradise Lost. Uh, this deals with the consequence of Adam and Eve eating the fruit in the garden. Meanwhile, the heinous and despiteful act of Satan done in Paradise and how he and the serpent had perverted Eve, her husband she, to taste the fatal fruit was known in heaven. For what can scape the eye of God all-seeing, or deceive his heart omniscient, who in all things wise and just hindered not Satan to attempt the mind of man, with strength entire and free will armed complete, to have discovered and repulsed whatever wiles or foe or seeming friend, for still they knew, and ought to have still remembered the high injunction not to taste the fruit, whoever tempted which they, not obeying, incurred, what could they less, 
the penalty and manifold in sin deserved to fall. Up in heaven, from paradise in haste, the angelic guards ascended, mute and sad for man, for of his state by this they knew. Much wondering how the subtle fiend had stolen entrance unseen. Soon, as the unwelcome news from earth arrived at heaven gate, displeased all were who heard. Dim sadness did not spare that time celestial visages, yet mixed with pity violated not their bliss. About the new arrived in multitudes, the ethereal people ran to hear and know how all befell. They towards the throne supreme accountable made haste to make appear with righteous plea their utmost vigilance and easily approved. When the most high eternal father from his secret cloud amidst in thunder uttered thus his voice, assembled angels, and ye powers returned from unsuccessful charge be not dismayed nor troubled at these tidings from the earth, which your sincerest care could not prevent, foretold so lately what would come to pass when first this tempter crossed the gulf from hell. I told ye then he should prevail and speed on his bad errand, man should be seduced and flattered out of all believing lies against his maker. No decree of mine, concurring to necessitate his fall, or touch with lightest moment of impulse his free will, to her own inclining left in even scale. But fallen he is, and now what rests but that the mortal sentence pass on his transgression death denounced that day, which he presumes already vain and void, because not yet inflicted as he feared by some immediate stroke. But soon shall find forbearance no acquittance ere day end. Justice shall not return as bounty scorned. But whom send I to judge them? Whom but thee, vicegerent's son? To thee I have transferred all judgment, whether in heaven or earth or hell. Easy it might be seen that I intend mercy, colleague with justice, sending thee man's friend, his mediator, his design, both ransom and redeemer voluntary, and destined man himself to judge man fallen. So spake the father, and unfolding bright toward the right hand his glory on the sun blazed forth unclouded deity. He full resplendent all his father manifest expressed, and thus divinely answered mild, Father eternal, thine is to decree, mine both in heaven and earth to do thy will supreme, that thou in me thy son beloved mayst ever rest well pleased. I go to judge on earth these thy transgressors, but thou knowst whoever judged the worst on me must light, when time shall be, for so I undertook before thee, and not repenting this obtain of right, that I may mitigate their doom on me derived, yet I shall temper so justice with mercy, as may illustrate most them fully satisfied, and thee appease attendants none shall need, nor train where none are to behold thy judgment, but the judged those two. The third best absent is condemned, convict by flight and rebel, to all law conviction to the serpent none belongs. Thus saying, from his radiant seat he rose of high collateral glory, him thrones and powers, princedoms and dominations, ministrant accompanied to heaven gate. From whence Eden and all the coast in prospect lay, down he descended straight. The speed of God's time counts not, though with swiftest minutes winged. 
Now is the sun in western cadence low from noon, and gentle airs due at their hour to fan the earth now waked and usher in the evening cool. When he from wrath more cool came, the mild judge and intercessor both to sentence man. The voice of God they heard now walking in the garden by soft wines brought to their ear. While day declined, they heard and from his presence hid themselves among the thickest trees, both man and wife to God approaching, thus to Adam called aloud. Where art thou, Adam? Want with joy to meet my coming seen far off? I miss thee here. Not pleased? Thus entertained with solitude, where obvious duty erewhile appeared unsought, or come I less conspicuous, or what change absents thee, or what chance detains, come forth. He came, and with him Eve more loath, though first to offend, discountenanced both and discomposed. Love was not in their looks either to God or to each other, but apparent guilt and shame and perturbation and despair, anger and obstinance and hate and guile, whence Adam, faltering long, thus answered brief. I heard thee in the garden, and of thy voice afraid being naked, hid myself, to whom the gracious judge, without revile, replied, my voice thou oft hast heard, and hast not feared, but still rejoiced. How is it now become so dreadful to thee? How thou art naked! Who hath told thee? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I gave thee charge thou shouldst not eat? To whom thus Adam sore beset replied, O heaven! In evil strait this day I stand before my judge, either to undergo myself the total crime, or to accuse my other self the partner of my life, whose failing, while her faith to me remains, I should conceal and not expose to blame by my complaint. But strict necessity subdues me, and calamitous constraint, lest on my head both sin and punishment, however insupportable, be all devolved. Though should I hold my peace, yet thou wouldst easily detect what I conceal. This woman, whom thou made to be my help, and gavest me as thy perfect gift, so good, so fit, so acceptable, so divine, that from her hand I could suspect no ill, and what she did, whatever in itself her doing seemed to justify the deed, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. To whom the sovereign presence thus replied, Was she thy God, that her thou didst obey before his voice? Or was she made thy guide superior, or but equal, that to her thou didst resign thy manhood, and the place wherein God set thee above her, made of thee and for thee, whose perfection far excelled hers in all real dignity. Adorned she was indeed, and lovely to attract thy love, not thy subjection. And her gifts were such as under government well seemed unseemly to bear rule, which was thy part and person, hadst thou known thyself aright. So having said he thus to even few, Say, woman, what is this which thou hast done? To whom sad Eve, with shame nigh o'erwhelmed, confessing soon, yet not before her judge bold or loquacious, thus abashed, replied, The serpent me beguiled, and I did eat. Whence, when the Lord God heard without delay to judgment, he proceeded on the accused, Serpent, thou brute, unable to transfer the guilt on him who made him instrument of mischief and polluted from the end of his creation. Justly, then, accursed, as vitiated in nature, more to no concern, not man, since he no further knew, nor altered his offence. 
Yet God at last to Satan first in sin his doom applied, though in mysterious terms judged as then best, and on the serpent thus his curse let fall. Because thou hast done this, thou art accursed. Above all cattle each beast of the field upon thy belly groveling thou shalt go, and dust shall eat all the days of thy life. Between thee and the woman I will put enmity, and between thine and her seed. Her seed shall bruise thy head, thou bruise his heel. So spake this oracle, then verified when Jesus, son of Mary, second Eve, saw Satan fall like lightning down from heaven. Prince of the air, then rising from his grave, spoiled principalities and powers, triumphant in open show, and with ascension bright captivity led captive through the air, the realm itself of Satan long usurped, whom he shall tread at last under our feet. E'en he who now foretold his fatal bruise, and to the woman thus his sentence turned. Thy sorrow. I will greatly multiply by the conception. Children thou shalt bring in sorrow forth, and to thy husband's will thine shall submit. He over thee shall rule. On Adam last thus judgment he pronounced, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife and eaten of the tree concerning which I charge thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat thereof. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Thou in sorrow shalt eat thereof all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles it shall bring thee forth unbid, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For thou out of ground wast taken, know thy birth, for dust thou art, and shall to dust return. So judged he man, both judge and saviour sent, and the instant stroke of death denounced that day, removed far off. Then pitying how they stood before him naked to the air, that now must suffer change. Disdained not to begin thenceforth the former servant to assume as when he washed his servants' feet, so now as father of his family he clad their nakedness with skins of beasts or slain, or as the snake with youthful coat repaid, and thought not much to clothe his enemies, nor he their outward only with the skins of beasts, but inward nakedness much more opprobrious with his robe of righteousness, arraying, covered from his father's sight, to him with swift ascent, he up returned into his blissful bosom, reassumed in glory as of old, to him appeased all, though all knowing what had passed with man recounted, mixing intercession sweet. Meanwhile, ere uh, thus was sinned and judged on earth, Within the gates of hell sat sin and death, in counter view within the gates, that now stood open wide, belching outrageous flame far into chaos since the fiend passed through, sin opening, who thus now to death began. O oh, son, why sit we here each other viewing idly while Satan, our great author, thrives in other worlds, and happiest seat provides for us his offspring dear. It cannot be but that success attains him. If mishap ere this he had returned with fury driven by his avengers, since no place like this can fit his punishment or his revenge, methinks I feel new strength within me rise, wings growing, and dominion given me large beyond this deep. 
whatever draws me on, or sympathy, or some co-natural force powerful at greatest distance to unite with secret amity, things of like kind by secretest conveyance, thou, oh my shade inseparable, must with me along, for death from sin no power can separate. But least the difficulty of passing back, stay his return, perhaps over this gulf impassable, impervious, let us try adventurous work. Yet, to thy power and mine, not unagreeable, to found a path over this main from hell to that new world where Satan now prevails, a monument of merit high to all the infernal host, easing their passage hence for intercourse or transmigration, as their lot shall lead. Nor can I miss the way so strongly drawn by this new-felt attraction and instinct. Whom thus the meagre shadow answered soon, Go whither fate and inclination strong leads thee. I shall not lag behind, nor e'er the way thou leading. Such a scent I draw of carnage. Pray innumerable, and taste the savour of death from all things there but live. Nor shall I to the work thou enterprises be wanting, but afford thee equal aid. So saying with delight he snuffed the smell of mortal change on earth, as when a flock of ravenous fowl, though many a league remote against the day of battle to a field where armies lie encamped, come flying, lured with scent of living carcasses designed for death the following day in bloody fight, so scented the grim feature, and upturned his nostril wide into the mucky air, sagacious of his quarry from so far, then both from out hell gates into the waste, wide anarchy of chaos damp and dark, flew diverse, and with power their power was great, hovering upon the waters, what they met, solid or slimy, as in raging sea tossed up and down, together crowded, drove from each side, shoaling towards the mouth of hell, as when two polar winds blowing averse upon the Cronian sea, together dry mountains of ice that stop the imagined way beyond Petsora eastward to the rich Cathian coast. The aggregated soil, death with his mace petrific, cold and dry, as with a trident smote and fixed as firm as Delos floating once, the rest his look bound with Gorgian rigour not to move, and with asphaltic slime, broad as the gate, deep as the roots of hell, the gathered breach they fastened, and the mole immense wrought on over the foaming deep high arched, a bridge of length prodigious joining to the wall immovable of this now fenceless world forfeit to death. From henceforth a passage broad, smooth, easy, inoffensive, down to hell. So if great things too small may be compared, Xerxes, the liberty of Greece to yoke from Susa, his Memnian palace high came to the sea, and over Hell's Pont bridging his way, Europe with Asia joined, and scourged with many a stroke the indignant waves. Now had they brought the work by wondrous art pontifical, a ridge of pendant rock over the vexed abyss, following the track of Satan to the selfsame place where he first lighted from his wing and landed safe from out of chaos to the other side bare of this round world. With pins of adamant and chains they made it fast, too fast they made and durable, and now in little space the confines met of Empyrean heaven and of this world, and on the left hand hell with long reach interposed. Three several waves in sight to each of these three places led. 
and now their way to earth they had descried. To paradise first tending, when behold Satan in likeness of an angel, bright betwixt the centaur and the scorpion steering his zenith, while the sun in Aries rose, disguised he came. But those his children dear, their parents soon discerned, though in disguise, he, after Eve seduced, unminded slunk into the wood fast by, and changing shape to observe the sequel, saw his guileful act by Eve, though all unweeting seconded upon her husband, saw their shame that sought vain covetures, but when he saw descend the Son of God, to judge them terrified, he fled, not hoping to escape, but shunned the present, fearing guilty what his wrath might suddenly inflict. That past returned by night, and listening, where the hapless pair sat in their sad discourse and various plaint, thence gathered his own doom, which understood not instant, but of future time. With joy and tidings fraught to hell he now returned, and at the brink of chaos, near the foot of this new wondrous pontifice, unhopped, met who to meet him came his offspring dear. Great joy was at their meeting, and at sight of that stupendous bridge his joy increased. Long he admiring stood, till sin his fair Enchanting daughter, thus the silence broke. O parent, these are thy magnificent deeds, thy trophies, which thou viewst as not thine own. Thou art their author and prime architect, for I no sooner in my heart divined my heart which by a secret harmony still moves with thine, joined in connection sweet, that thou on earth hadst prospered, which thy looks now also evidence, but straight I felt, though distant from the worlds between, yet felt that I must after thee with this my son, such fatal consequence unites us three. Hell could no longer hold us in her bounds, nor this unvoyageable gulf obscure detain from following thy illustrious track. Thou hast achieved our liberty, confined within hell gates till now. Thou us empowered to fortify thus far and overlay with this portentous bridge the dark abyss. Thine now is all this world. Thy virtue hath won what thy hands builded not. Thy wisdom gained with odds which war hath lost and fully avenged our foil in heaven. Here thou shalt, monarch, reign. There didst not. There, let him still victor sway as battle hath adjudged, from this new world retiring by his own doom alienated, and henceforth monarchy with thee divide by all things parted by the imperial bounds his quadrature from thy orbicular world, or try thee now more dangerous to his throne. Whom thus the Prince of Darkness answered glad, Fair daughter, and thou, son and grandchild both, High proof ye now have given to be the race of Satan, For I glory in the name antagonist of heaven's almighty king, Amply have merited of me, of all the infernal empire, That so near heaven's door triumphal with triumphal act have met, Mine with this glorious work, and made one realm, hell, and this world, one realm, one continent, of easy thoroughfare. Therefore, while I descend through darkness, on you rode with ease to my associate powers, them to acquaint with these successes, and with them rejoice. You to this way. Among these numerous orbs, all yours right down to paradise descend. 
There dwell and reign in bliss, thence on the earth dominion exercise and in the air, chiefly on man, so Lord of all declared, him first made your thrall and lastly kill my substitutes, I send ye and create plenipotent on earth of matchless might issuing from me on your joint vigour. Now my hold of this new kingdom all depends, through sin to death exposed by my exploit. If your joint power prevails the affairs of hell, no detriment need fear. Go and be strong. So saying he dismissed them, they with speed their course through thickest constellations held spreading their bane. The blasted stars looked one, and planets, planets shook, real eclipse then suffered. The other way Satan went down the causey to hell gate. On either side disparted chaos overbuilt exclaimed, and with rebounding surge the bars assailed that scorned his indignation. Through the gate wide open and unguarded Satan passed, and all about fond desolate, for those appointed to sit there had left their charge, flown to the upper world. The rest were all far to the inland retired about the walls of Pandemonium, city and proud seat of Lucifer, so by allusion called of that bright star to Satan Paragon. There kept their watch the legions, while the grand in council sat solicitous what chance might intercept their emperor sent, so he departing gave command, and they observed, as when the Tartar from his Russian foe by Astrakhan over the snowy plains retires, or Bactrian Sophie from the horns of Turkish Crescent leaves all waste beyond the realm of Aludul, or in his retreat to Taurus or Casbian. So these the late heaven-banished host left desert utmost hell, many a dark leave reduced in careful watch round their metropolis, and now expecting each hour their great adventurer from the search of foreign worlds, he through the midst unmarked, in show plebeian angel militant of lowest order, passed. And from the door of that Plutonian hell, invisible, ascended his high throne, which under state of richest texture spread. At the upper end was placed in regal lustre. Down a while he sat, and round about him saw unseen. At last, as from a cloud his fulgent head and shape, star bright appeared or brighter clad, with what permissive glory since his fall was left him, or false glitter. All amazed at that so sudden blaze the Stygian throng bent their aspect, and whom they wished beheld. Their mighty chief returned, Loud was their acclaim, forth rushed in haste the great consulting peers, raised from their dark divan, and with like joys congratulant approached him, who with hand silence, and with these words attention won. Thrones, dominations, princedoms, virtues, powers, for in possession such not only of right I call ye and declare ye now, return successful beyond hope, to lead ye forth triumphant out of this infernal pit abominable, accursed, the house of woe and dungeon of our tyrant. Now possess as lords a spacious world, to our native heaven little inferior, by my adventure hard with peril great achieved. Long were to tell what I have done, what suffered, with what pain voyaged the unreal, vast, unbounded deep of horrible confusion over which by sin and death a Broadway now is paved to expedite your glorious march. 
But I toiled out my uncouth passage, forced to ride the intractable abyss, plunged in the womb of unoriginal night and chaos wide, that jealous of their secrets fiercely oppose my journey, strange with clamorous uproar, protesting fate supreme. Thence how I found the new created world which fame in heaven long had foretold, a fabric wonderful of absolute perfection, therein man placed in a paradise by our exile made happy. Him by fraud I have seduced from his creator, and the more to increase your wonder with an apple. He thereat offended, worth your laughter, hath given up both his beloved man and all his world to sin and death a prey, and sent to us without our hazard labour or alarm to range in and to dwell and over man to rule as over all he should have ruled. True is, me also he hath judged, or rather me not, but the brute serpent in whose shape man I deceived, that which to me belongs is enmity, which he will put between me and mankind. I am to bruise his heel, his seed, when is not set, shall bruise my head. A world who would not purchase with a bruise, or much more grievous pain. He hath the account of my performance. What remains, ye gods, but up and enter now full bliss. So having said a while, he stood expecting their universal shout and high applause to fill his ear. When contrary, he hears on all sides from innumerable tongues a dismal universal hiss the sound of public scorn. He wondered, but not long had leisure, wondering at himself now more, his visage drawn, he felt too sharp and spare, his arms clung to his ribs, his legs entwined each other, thus supplanted down, he fell, a monstrous serpent on his belly, prone, reluctant, but in vain, a greater power now ruled him, punished in the shape he sinned, According to his doom, he would have spoke but his for his return with forked tongue to forked tongue, for now were all transformed alike to serpents, all as accessories to his bold riot. Dreadful was the din of hissing through the hall, thick swarming now with complicated monsters, head and tail, scorpion and asp, and Amphisbana, dire Serastes, horned Hydrus and Elops drear, and Dispas, not so thick swarmed once the soil bedropped with blood of Gorgon or the Isle of Theusa. But still greatest he, the midst now dragon grown, larger than whom the sun engendered in the Pythian vale on slime, huge python, and his power no less he seemed above the rest still to retain. They all him followed, issuing forth to the open field, where all yet left of that revolted rout, heaven fallen, in station stood or just array, sublime with expectation when to see in triumph issuing forth their glorious chief. They saw. But other sight instead, a crowd of ugly serpents. Horror on them fell with horror sympathy. For what they saw, they felt themselves now changing down their arms. Down! Fell both spear and shield. Down! They as fast, and the dire hiss renewed, and from the dire form catched by contagion, like in punishment as in their crime, thus was to peace they meant turn in to exploding hiss, triumph to shame cast on themselves from their own mouths. There stood a grove hard by, sprung up with this their change. His will who reigns above to aggravate their penance, laden with fruit, 
like that which grew in paradise, the bait of Eve, used by the tempter. On that prospect strange, their earnest eyes they fixed, imagining for one forbidden tree a multitude now risen to work them further woe or shame, yet parched with scolding thirst and hunger fierce, though to delude them scent could not abstain, but on they round in heaps, and up the trees climbing sat, thicker than the snaky locks than curled Megara, greedily they plucked the fruitage fair to sight, like that which grew near the bitumous lake where Sodom flamed. This more delusive, not the touch, but taste deceived, they fondly thinking to allay their appetite with gust, instead of fruit chewed bitter ashes, which the offended taste with splattering noise rejected. Oft they assayed hunger and thirst, constraining drugged, as oft with hatefulest disrelish, wry their jaws with soot and cinders filled, so oft they fell into the same illusion not as man whom they triumphed once lapsed. Thus were they plagued and worn with famine, long and ceaseless hiss, till their lost shape permitted they resumed yearly and joined some say to undergo this annual humbling certain numbered days, to dash their pride and joy for man seduced. However, some tradition... They dispersed among the heathen of their purchase got, and fabled how the serpent whom they called Ophion, with Eurynome, the wide encroaching Eve, perhaps had first the rule of high Olympus, thence by Saturn driven and Ops, ere yet Dictian Jove was born. Meanwhile, in paradise the hellish pair too soon arrived, sin there in power before once actual, now in body, and dwell habitual habitant behind her death, close following pace for pace, not mounted yet on his pale horse, to whom sin thus began, second of Satan sprung, or conquering death, what thinkst thou of our empire now, though earned with travail difficult? Not better far, and still at hell's dark threshold to have sat watch, unnamed, undreaded, and thyself half starved. Whom thus the sin-born monster answered soon to me, who with eternal famine pied, Alike is hell or paradise or heaven. Their best, where most I a raven I may meet, which here, though plenteous, all too little seems to stuff this moor, this vast, unhide bound core. To whom the incestuous mother thus replied, Thou therefore on these herbs and fruits and flowers feed first. On each beast next, and fish and fowl, no homely morsels in whatever thing the slithe of time mows down devour unspared, till I in man residing through the race, his thoughts, his looks, words, actions all infect, and season him with last and sweetest prey. This said, they both betook their several ways, both to destroy or unimmortal make all kinds, and for destruction to mature sooner or later, which the Almighty seeing from his transcendent seat the saints among to those bright orders uttered thus his voice. See, with what heat these dogs of hell advance to waste and havoc yonder world, which I so fair and good created, and had still kept in that state had not the folly of man let in these wasteful furies who impute folly to me. So doth the prince of hell and his adherents, that with so much ease I suffer them to enter and possess a place so heavenly, and conniving seem to gratify my scornful enemies, that laugh, 
as if transported with some fit of passion. I, to them, had quitted all at random, yielded up to their misrule. And no, not that I called and drew them thither, my hell-hounds, to lick up the draught and filth which man's polluting sin had taint, hath shed on what was pure, till crammed and gorged, nigh burst with sucked and glutted offal, at one sling of thy victorious arm, well-pleasing sun, both sin and death, and yawning grave at last, through chaos hurled, obstruct the mouth of hell for ever, and seal up his ravenous jaws. Then heaven and earth renewed shall be made pure to sanctify, that shall receive no stain, till then the curse pronounced on both proceeds. He ended, and the heavenly audience loud sang hallelujah to the sound of seas through multitude that sung, just are thy ways, righteous are thy decrees on all thy works. Who can extenuate thee? Next to the sun, destined restorer of mankind, by whom new heaven and earth shall to the ages rise, or down from heaven descend. Such was their song, while the Creator, calling forth by name his mighty angels, gave them several charge, as sorted best with present things. The sun had first his precept, so to move to shine, as might affect the earth with cold and heat, scarce tolerable, and from the north to call decrepit winter, from the south to bring solstice summer's heat, to the blank moon her office they prescribed, to the other five their planetary motions and aspects, in sextile squared and trine and opposite of noxious efficacy, and when to join in synod unbenign, and taught the fixed their influence malignant when to shower, which of them rising with the sun or falling should prove tempestuous. To the winds they set their corners, when with blustered to confound sea, air, and shore. The thunder, when to roll with terror through the dark aerial hall. Some say he bids his angels turn askance, the poles of earth twice ten degrees and more from the sun's axle. They with labour push to bleak the centric globe. Some say the sun was bid turn rains from the equinoctial road like distant breadth to Taurus with the seven Atlantic sisters and the Spartan twins up to the tropic Carab. Thence down amain by Leo and the virgin and the scales as deep as Capricorn to bring in change of seasons to each clime. Else had the spring perpetual smiled on earth with verdant flowers, equal in days and nights except to those beyond the polar circles. To them day had unbenighted shone while the low sun to recompense his distance in their sight had rounded still the horizon and not known or east or west, which had forbid the snow from cold Estotiland and south as far beneath Megallon. At that tasted fruit the sun, as from Theestian banquet, turned his course intended. Else how would the world inhabited, though sinless, more than now avoided pinching cold and scorching heat? These changes in the heavens, though slow, produced like change on sea and land, sideral blast, vapour and mist, and exhalation hot, corrupt and pestilent. Now from the north of Narumba and the Samiard shore, bursting their brazen dungeon, and with ice and snow and hail and stormy gust and floor, Boreas and Cacaeus, and Argestes loud and Thrasius, rend the woods and seas upturn, with adverse blast upturns them from the south, notice an aphor black with thunderous clouds, from Cephaleona, thwart of these as fierce forth rush the Levant and the ponent winds, 
Eurus and Zephyr with their lateral noise, Serocco and Libeccio. Thus began outrage from liveless things. But discord first, daughter of sin, among the irrational death introduced through fierce antipathy. Beast now with beast gan war, and fowl with fowl, and fish with fish, to graze the herb all leaving devoured each other. Now stood much in awe of man, but fled him, or with countenance grim glared on him passing. These were from without the growing miseries, which Adam saw already in part, though hid in gloomiest shade to sorrow abandoned, but worse felt within, and in a troubled sea of passion tossed, thus to disburden sought with sad complaint. O oh, miserable of happy, is this the end of this new glorious world of me, so late the glory of that glory, who now become accursed of blessed? Hide me from the face of God, whom to behold was then my height of happiness. Yet well, if here would end the misery, I deserved it, and would bear my own deservings, but this will not serve. All that I eat or drink or shall beget is propagated curse. Voice, once heard delightfully, increase and multiply. Now death to hear. For what can I increase or multiply but curses on my head? Who, of all ages to succeed, but feeling the evil on him brought by me, will curse my head, ill fare our ancestor impure. For this we may thank Adam, but his thanks shall be the execration. So besides mine own that bide upon me, all from me shall with a fierce reflux on me redound. On me as on their natural centre light heavy, though in their place. O oh, fleeting joys of paradise, dear brought with lasting woes. Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mould me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me, or here place in this delicious garden? As my will concurred not to my being, it were but right and equal to reduce me to my dust. Desirous to resign and render back all I received, unable to perform thy terms too hard, by which I was to hold the good I sought not, to the loss that sufficient penalty. Why hast thou added the sense of endless woes? Inexplicable thy justice seems. Yet to say truth too late I thus contest. Then should I have been refused those terms, whatever. When they were proposed, thou didst accept them. Wilt thou enjoy the good, then cavil the conditions? Without thy leave, what if thy son proved disobedience, and reproved, retort, wherefore didst thou beget me? I sought it not. Wouldst thou admit for his contempt of thee that proud excuse? Yet him not thy election, but natural necessity begot. God made thee of choice his own, and of his own to serve him. Thy reward was of his grace. Thy punishment then justly is at his will. Be it so, for I submit his doom is fair, that dust I am, and shall to dust return. O oh, welcome hour whenever! Why delays his hand to execute what his decree fixed on this day? Why do I overlive? Why am I mocked with death and lengthened out to deathless pain? How gladly would I meet morality in my sentence and be earth insensible? How glad would lay me down as in my mother's lap? There I should rest and sleep secure, his dreadful voice no more would thunder in my ears, no fear of worse to me and to my offspring would torment me with cruel expectation, yet one doubt pursues me still. Lest all I cannot die, lest that pure breath of life, the spirit of man, which God inspired, cannot together perish with this corporeal clod. 
Then in the grave or in some other dismal place, who knows, but I shall die a living death. O oh, thought horrid, if true, yet why? It was but breath of life that sinned, what dies, but what had life and sin, the body properly hath neither. All of me then shall die, let this appease, the doubt since humane reach no further knows, for though the Lord of all be infinite, is his wrath also? Be it, man is not so, but mortal doomed. How can he exercise wrath without end on man whom death must end? Can he make deathless death? That were to make strange contradiction, which to God himself impossible is held as argument of weakness, not of power. Will he draw out for anger's sake finite to infinite? In punished man to satisfy his rigour satisfied never? That were to extend his sentence beyond dust and nature's law? By which all causes else according still to the reception of their matter act, not to the extent of their own sphere, but say that death be not one stroke, as I supposed bereaving sense, but endless misery from this day onward, which I feel begun both in me and without me, and so last to perpetuity, I me. That fear comes thundering back with dreadful revolution on my defenceless head. Both death and I am found eternal and incorporate both. Nor I on my part single, in me all posterity stands cursed. Fair patrimony that I must leave ye sons. Oh, were I able to waste it all myself and leave ye none. So disinherited now would ye bless me now your curse. Ah, why should all mankind for one man's fault thus guiltless be condemned, if guiltless? But from me what can proceed but all corrupt, both mind and will depraved, not to do only, but to will the same with me? How can they then acquitted stand in sight of God, him after all disputes forced I absolve, all my evasions vain and reasonings, though through mazes led me still but to my own conviction, first and last on me, me only, as the source and spring of all corruption. All the blame lights due. So might the wrath fond wish. Couldst thou support the burden heavier than the earth to bear, then all the world much heavier, though divided with that bad woman. Thus what thou desirest and what thou fearest alike destroys all hope of refuge beyond all past example and future to Satan only like both the crime and doom, O oh, conscience, into what abyss of fears and horrors hast thou driven me, out of which I find no way from deep to deeper plunged. Thus Adam to himself lamented loud. Thus Adam to himself lamented loud. Through the still night, not now as ere man fell, wholesome and cool and mild, but with black air accompanied with damps and dreadful gloom, which to his evil conscience represented all things with double terror. On the ground outstretched he lay, on the cold ground, and oft cursed his creation. Death as oft cursed of tardy execution, since denounced the day of his offence. Why comes not death, said he? With one thrice acceptable stroke to end me, shall truth fail to keep her word, justice divine, not hasten to be just, but death comes not at call, justice divine, mends not her slowest pace for prayers or cries. O oh, woods, O oh, fountains, hillocks, dales, and bowers, with other echo late I taught your shades to answer, and resound far other song, whom thus afflicted 
when sad Eve beheld desolate where she sat approaching nigh. Soft words to his fierce passion she essayed, but her with stern regard he thus repelled. Out of my sight, thou serpent, that name best befits thee, with him leagued. Thyself as false and hateful, nothing wants but that thy shape like his and colour serpentine may show thy inward fraud toward all creatures from thee henceforth. Lest that too heavenly form pretended to hellish falsehood snare them. But for thee I had persisted happy. Had not thy pride and wandering vanity, when lest was safe, rejected my forewarning and disdain not to be trusted, longing to be seen, though by the devil himself, him overweening to overreach, but with the serpent meeting, fooled and beguiled by him, thou, I by thee, to trust thee by my side, imagined wise, constant, mature proof against all assaults, and understood not all was but a show, rather than solid virtue, all but a rib, crooked by nature, bent as now appears, more to the part sinister from me drawn, well, if thrown out as supernumerary, to my just number found. Oh, why did God create a wise that peopled highest heaven with spirits masculine create at last this novelty on earth, this fair defect of nature, and not fill the world at once with men as angels without feminine, or find some other way to generate mankind. This mischief had not then befallen, and more that shall befall innumerable disturbances on earth through female snares and straight conjunction with this sex. For either he never shall find out fit mate, but such as some misfortune brings him, or mistake, or whom he wishes, most shall seldom gain through her perverseness, but shall see her gain by far worse if she love withheld by parents or his happiest choice too late shall meet already linked and wedlock bound to f a fell adversary his hate or shame which infinite calamity shall cause to human life and household peace confound he added not and from her turned but Eve, not so repulsed, with tears that ceased not flowing, and tresses all disordered, at his feet fell humble, and embracing him, besought his peace, and thus proceeded in her plaint, Forsake me not thus, Adam, witness heaven, what love sincere and reverence in my heart I bear thee, and unweeting have offended, unhappily deceived thy suppliant. I beg and clasp thy knees, bereave me not, whereon I live, thy gentle looks, thy aid, thy counsel in this uttermost distress, my only strength and stay. Forlorn of thee, whither shall I betake me? Where subsist? While yet we live scarce one short hour, perhaps between us two let there be peace, both joining as joined in injuries, one enmity against a foe by doom express assigned us the cruel serpent. On me exercise not thy hatred for this misery befallen, on me already lost, me then thyself more miserable. Both have sinned, but thou against God only, I against God and thee and to the place of judgment will return. There, with my cries, importune heaven, that all the sentence from thy head remove may light on me, soul, cause to thee of all this woe, me, me only just object of this ire. She ended weeping, and her lowly plight immovable, till peace obtained from fault acknowledged and deplored in Adam wrought commiseration. Soon his heart relented towards her, his life so late and so delight now at his feet submissive in distress, creature so fair, his reconcilement seeking, his counsel whom she had displeased, his aid, at one disarm his anger all he lost, and thus 
with peaceful words upraised her soon. Unwary, and too desirous as before, so now of what thou knowst not, who desires the punishment all on thyself, alas, bear thine own first, ill able to sustain his full wrath, whose thou feel'st as yet lest part, and my displeasure best so ill. If prayers could alter high degrees, I to that place would speed before thee, and be louder heard, that on my own head all might be visited, thy frailty and infirmer sex forgiven, to me committed, and by me exposed. But rise, let us no more contend, nor blame each other, blamed enough elsewhere, but strive in offices of love, how we may lighten each other's burden in our share of woe. Since this day's death denounced, if aught I see will prove no sudden, but a slow-paced evil, a long day's dying to augment our pain, and to our seed, O hapless seed, derived. To whom thus Eve, recovering heart, replied Adam, By sad experiment I know how little weight my words with thee can find, found so erroneous. Thence by just event found so unfortunate, nevertheless restored by thee, vile as I am, to place of new acceptance, hopeful to regain thy love, the sole contentment of my heart, living or dying, from thee I will not hide what thoughts in my unquiet breast are risen. Tending to some relief of our extremes or end, though sharp and sad yet tolerable, as in our evils and of easier choice, if care of our descent perplex us most, which must be borne to certain woe devoured by death at last, and miserable it is to be to others cause of misery, our own begotten, and of our loins to bring into this cursed world a woeful race that after wretched life must be at last food for so foul a monster. In thy power it lies, yet ere conception to prevent the race unblessed, to being yet unbegot, childless thou art, childless remain, so death shall be deceived his glut and with us to be forced to satisfy his ravenous more. But if thou judge it hard and difficult, conversing, looking, loving, to abstain from love's due rites, nuptial embraces sweet, and with desires to languish without hope, before the present object languishing with like desire, which would be misery and torment less than none of which we dread, then both ourselves and seed at once to free from what we fear for both, let us make short, let us seek death, or he not found supply with our own hands his office on ourselves. Why stand we longer shivering under fears that show no end but death and have the power of many ways to die the shortest choosing, destruction with destruction to destroy? She ended here, or vehement despair broke off the rest, so much of death her thoughts had entertained, as dyed her cheeks with pale, but Adam, with such counsel, nothing swayed, to better hopes his more attentive mind labouring had raised. And thus, to Eve, replied, Eve, thy contempt of life and pleasure seems to argue in thee something more sublime and excellent than what thy mind contemns. But self-destruction therefore sought refutes that excellence thought in thee, and implies not thy contempt but anguish and regret for loss of life and pleasure over loved. Or if thou covet death as utmost end of misery, so thinking to evade the penalty pronounced, doubt not but God hath wiselier armed his vengeful ire than so to be forestalled. Much more I fear lest death so snatched will not exempt us from the pain we are by doom to pay. Rather such acts of contumacy will provoke the highest to make death in us live. 
then let us seek some safer resolution which methinks I have in view, calling to mind with heed part of our sentence, that thy seed shall bruise the serpent's head, piteous amends, unless be meant, whom I conjecture, our grand foe Satan, who in the serpent hath contrived against us this deceit to crush his head, would be revenge indeed, which will be lost by death, brought on ourselves, or childless days resolved, as thou proposed. So our foe shall scape his punishment ordained, and we instead shall double ours upon our heads. No more be mentioned then of violence against ourselves, and willful barrenness, that cuts us off from hope and saves us only rancour and pride, impatience, and despite reluctance against God and his just yoke laid on our necks. Remember, with what mild and gracious temper he both heard and judged without wrath or reviling. We expected immediate dissolution, which we thought was meant by death that day, when, lo, to thee pains only in childbearing were foretold, and bringing forth, soon recompensed with joy, fruit of thy womb. On me the curse a slope glanced on the ground, with labour I must earn my bread, what harm, idleness, had been worse. My labour will sustain me, and lest cold or heat should injure us, his timely care hath unbesought provided, and his hands clothed us unworthy, pitying while he judged. How much more, if we pray him, will his ear be open and his heart to pity incline and teach us further by what means to shun the inclement seasons, rain, ice, hail and snow, which now the sky with various face begins to show us in this mountain, while the winds blow, moist and keen, shattering the graceful locks of these fair spreading trees, which bids us seek some better shroud, some better warmth to cherish our limbs benumbed ere uh, this diurnal star leave cold the night, how we, his gathered beams reflected, may now with matter sair forment, or by collusion of two bodies grind the air a trite to fire, as late the clouds justling or pushed with winds rude in their shock, tying the slant lightning, whose thwart flame driven down kindles the gummy bark of fire or pine, and sends a comfortable heat from far, which might supply the sun such fire to use, and what else be remedy or cure to evils which our own misdeeds have wrought, he will instruct us praying, and of grace beseeching him, so as we need not fear to pass commodiously this life sustained by him with many comforts till we end in dust our final rest and native home. What better can we do then to the place repairing where he judged us, prostrate fall before him reverent, and there confess humbly our faults and pardon beg with tears, watering the ground, and with such sighs the air frequenting, sent from hearts contrite in sign of sorrow feigned and humiliation meek. Undoubtedly he will relent and turn from his displeasure, in whose look serene, when angry most he seemed and most severe, what else but favour, grace and mercy shone? So spake our father penitent, nor Eve felt less remorse. They forthwith to the place repairing where he judged them prostrate fell before him reverent, and both confessed humbly their faults, and pardon begged with tears watering the ground, and with their sighs the air frequenting sent from hearts contrite, in sign of sorrow unfeigned and humiliation meek. End of book 10